Thank you all for being here. I know it's the last week of class. So I know what that means. It's the last week for us at Penn State, too. And um, we don't have any readings scheduled. <laughs> so I will try to make this engaging and interesting. And um, I am keen. Can you hear in the back? Yeah? I'm keen to hear your questions at the end. And I've got all this stuff here that I am organizing. Um, I'm going to add my thanks to Lisa Sewell, Adrian Perry, and um, Alan Drew, professors here, who have been, already been such wonderful hosts. And also to the students um, in the class I met with. Thank you. It's, it's like already fun to be here. And we haven't started reading yet. Um, and I'm going to read from, this is not the normal shape of a poetry book. This is. But it's because it has photographs. And usually I come with a photographer. Um, and so I'm just going to show you his name up there. And I'm going to talk to you. And he's the one who usually deals with the computer stuff. Um, but. Um, Stephen Rubin is the photographer, and I'm going to show photographs from the book, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him first, even though he's not here, um, so that you get a sense of, of his process and his project. And the first thing I think that seems important to say is that we started working independently of one another. We didn't know one another. We were both professors at Penn State. And um, I started writing poems, and he just took off and started taking photographs. Because we are artists, and the way we deal with something that's confusing or confounding, for him is to pick up his camera. For me, is to pick up my pen and my notebook. So this is what people usually think of when they hear the word fracking, if they think of anything at all. But actually, this is not fracking. This is um, a drill rig. And they could be drilling for an unconventional gas well that would then later be fracked, or they could be drilling for a conventional gas or, or oil well. Um, and this is uh, north of Williamsport next to a place called Ryder Park. This shows you what happens with fracking. Um, once that well, once they drill down about a mile, maybe further, um, they know, you know, it's too far below the earth to be guided by GPS. So they know they hit the Marcellus Shale Shale is sedimentary rock that's very rich in organic matter. So long, long ago, animals, uh, plants, in Pennsylvania, there were these enormous ferns, you know, prehistoric time. Um, that's what formed this shale. There's also sometimes remains of ancient oceans and even salt water. 10 times the salinity of our ocean. There are even living microorganisms down there, still, from so long ago. So they know they've hit the shale because this layer is also radioactive. And once they hit it, then they go out laterally with this drill. And they can go as much as two miles, even more than two miles. So it's. This whole industrial process is really an incredible feat of engineering. Like, you just have to say that. It's incredible. And the guys at Penn State who are involved in petroleum engineering, I mean, I understand why they're excited about it, because this is incredible technology. Anyway, so the drill goes out. And then once the drill happens, then is when they frack. And they bring in anywhere between 4 million and 8 million gallons of water, together with all kinds of chemicals. 
biocides, that is to kill any organisms down there, lubricants to uh, loosen the rock, um, silica sand, or other fine particulates. So all this stuff, and other chemicals, some of them we don't always know what they are because they aren't disclosed by the companies. And then great pressure, and that breaks the rock, sort of forced down there with big diesel engines, and those cracks you see are supposed to represent the shale cracking, and that's what releases the gas, and the same process for oil, fracking for oil, and then they are required in Pennsylvania to retrieve at least a third of that liquid. The rest of it stays, can stay down there. Um, so that stuff comes gushing up, and there are men up there at the wellhead who manage it. So this is actually what fracking looks like. This is the same site you saw earlier when it's being fracked. And they have these big uh, containers to manage all the liquid. In this place, this was a five acre well pad. And in Pennsylvania, five acres is the minimum size that you don't have to build earthen impoundments around it to prevent a spill. And so often they try to keep it at five acres. And there was a spill here. So people who know of the Loyal Sock Creek north of Williamsport, it was contaminated by this well. We have fracking in over 20 states in the United States, um, also all over the world. Um, I'm at Penn State, and that's a kind of Penn State University of Texas at Austin and the Colorado Mine College are the kind of three institutions that are really providing the intellectual resources for this process, um, engineering, geology. And um, I know folks from Penn State have been developing fracking in places like Argentina, Poland, South Africa, countries like France have outlawed it, Germany. This is the Marcellus Shale. This is the deposit where uh, the gas remains. New York State has a ban on fracking, as does Maryland. You can see it's a little bit of Maryland there. Um, so the fracking is happening in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Eastern Ohio. Um, the watershed for the Delaware River, which is where you all get your drinking water here in Philadelphia, is a, also a frack-free zone. And that has to do with the protection that was put in place at the time of um, John F. Kennedy. But people are fighting it. So that's something to pay attention to. In Pennsylvania, um, these, these dots represent, I just have new numbers on this, so I have to check my paper, 11,885 drilled unconventional wells are the purple dots, or no, the yellow dots, I guess. And the purple dots are 12,343 violations at unconventional well sites. So we have more than 1,000 more violations than wells. Stephen, so Stephen was living in State College. He, earlier in his life, had made his living as a freelance photojournalist and traveled all over the world. He had photographs in National Geographic and New York Times, and he was at Kosovo and Rwanda. And I think, you know, basically he was getting old and decided it was time to settle down. So he got an MFA, and now he teaches documentary poetry at Penn State. He had never looked for a story in his backyard. He was always traveling somewhere else in the world. But he heard about fracking and got curious and started driving up into the state forests near us. 
And he came upon things like this. This is a, a water line. And this. Those are condensate tanks where a well, this is what it looks like after the well has been drilled and fracked, and now it's in production. Trucks like this, which he followed to workers. And these women were hired to paint um, the tanks, the condensate tanks that are placed above the wells. And these guys were just spreading grass seed and putting straw down after a pipeline was laid. So he, one week he saw these guys with that straw, and on the weekend he went to Washington, D.C. to a protest. It was the first anti-fracking protest, and saw these people wearing straw hats. Um, and he just got really interested, especially in those two themes, the workers. Who are the people who are getting jobs in the industry? Why are they getting jobs? And who are the people who have become mobilized as activists? So he's photographed a lot of protests. Um, this rally was a pro-fracking event in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in uh, 2014 that was sponsored by the industry. And he has a bunch of photographs of signs, the signs, the t-shirts, the lunch, everything provided by the industry. These people were um, educated, trained to work in the industry and on their graduation day they got to go out and see a fracking rig. So he was following them around and got that photo. As for myself, um, I am a, a long time Pennsylvanian. I grew up in central Pennsylvania, well, southwestern Pennsylvania. I was born in central Pennsylvania. I grew up south of Pittsburgh. And my ancestors have been here a long time, mostly farmers. Um, and I became a poet. It, like, was a strange thing in my family. People didn't do that. Um, but I was mostly writing the kind of poems that people write about their experience, their family. Um, and I live in a small town of about 6,000 people. And in 2010, we get our drinking water from a big spring. 2010, I started seeing these tankers going from the spring, like constantly. They were going up to the mountain where they were fracking. Around that time, a big transmission pipeline was laid over the ridge about two miles from my house. Um, this is how it is. It's just kind of outside your line of vision. But it wasn't until I was riding on the back of my husband's motorcycle, going up to Ithaca, New York. We were going up Route 15, rural Pennsylvania, and there on the top of a ridge, I saw all this stuff happening. There was this long furrow dug in the side of the ridge. There was a pipeline. There was a helicopter overhead with some red box dangling from it. There were all these pickup trucks. There were all these men over there. What in the world? So I asked the waitress um, at the diner across the road from all this activity. And the waitress basically said, it's fracking. We think it's a pretty good idea around here. People are getting some money. People don't, you know, farmers, people have been able to buy a tractor, paint the barn, and that's really how the project started. Um, and I returned many times to that diner because it was a site where they provided fuel for the trucks, they fed the men, they leased land for them to park their equipment. And so I'd like to start the reading with poem that takes place at that diner. And I will confess to you, this is not my favorite way to work, but I, honestly, I just talked to the guy, listened to him very carefully. I mean, this project is all about two things, curiosity and listening. Three things, research. Um, which could involve listening. Um, but basically, I talked to the guy, and I knew when he started talking to me, this was an important conversation. And then I paid my bill and I ran out to the car and wrote down his language as much as I could remember. 
So this is the, story, the poem that comes from Fry Brothers Turkey Ranch. Happy holds forth at Fry Brothers Turkey Ranch on Route 15. A tall man with a mullet and jumpsuit strides toward a booth by the window, orders a hot turkey sandwich, water with lemon, and pulls out the shack, paperback my mom once urged me to read. The shack is a house you make from your own pain, according to the author, a former hotel night clerk. The man prays over his plate, then looks up at me, watching, and smiles. Where are you from, I ask, because that's all I ever think to say. West Virginia, but I live in fair chance near Uniontown. I tell him I went to Ohio Pile for my prom picnic, and that's a lovely part of the state he's from. Nah, he says. It's just a river and mountains where someone built a hotel and store a long time ago to make money. Then he waves at the taxidermy. Look at those turkeys. How many $8 sandwiches come off one of those birds? It's just people taking what they can. Like, we're fracking some poor farmer's field out on Route 6 right now. <coughs> Cow frack. Like it says on the suit. Calgary's the base. Fracking's what we do. We pry the earth apart with chemicals, sand, water, and enough pressure to strip the paint off your car. It's government and big oil in cahoots like usual. I have a load of hydrochloric acid in the parking lot. He lifts his fork. I ask how long he's worked this job. Five days. It's six on, three off, six nights on, three off. George Bush, and I voted for him, changed the law. Used to be 70 hours a week in a truck meant 70 hours. But now, if you're standing or driving on a service road, it doesn't count. While I wait for my stage at the well, it doesn't count. Can't sleep in the cab can't escape the noise and odors. I'm not a bad person. Sure, I have regrets. Wish I hadn't been an athlete. Should have listened to my teachers. Shouldn't have let my sister and girlfriends do my homework. But I'm not a bad person. I was an iron worker. Had a job in Morgantown, supposed to last two years. It lasted five weeks, so I told my wife, I'll drive truck, warm in the winter, cool in the heat. She's a lawyer, but doesn't make that much. Public defender. She says, everyone deserves a fair trial, but look, what we're doing out here is not good. I sit forever in the cab and pray, take me now. Are you a Christian? Sorry. I'm just so tired. The poison that comes up, they pump back into wells. It might seem okay now, but what's to say it will stay put for two years or ten? Or how about when our grandchildren grow up? You ever read The Shack? It's my life, the first five chapters. I read them over and over. My nickname's Happy. Happy, I tell him. Your lunch must be cold by now. See what I've done? Now, my usual, I mean, what ethically I prefer is not to steal people's language like that. Um, what I prefer to do is get to know people and to visit them multiple times and um, just write down things that they tell me. And often, if I can talk with them more than one time, I can understand what's really important to them. And it's about my hearing, like what, what really matters to them. And this next piece, which is longer, um, 
I kind of created in that way. Um, and I'll just, there are a couple things I want to explain to you before I read it. One is that um, in southwestern Pennsylvania, there's a kind of coal called soft coal or bituminous coal. So in the northeast, north of here, just north of, not far, north, there's a kind of coal called hard coal, anthracite. But in southwestern Pennsylvania, the soft coal is very, very pure, and it was used, um, and it still is, you partially bake it. In the olden days, they baked it in these brick ovens, and you'll see a, a picture of one shortly, but um, they partially bake it in the way that you kind of partially burn wood to make charcoal, like for a barbecue. So um, this coal and this coke, which is this product that is baked, is used as um, fuel for steel production. So southwestern Pennsylvania is where they made steel in Pittsburgh, and in the rural areas, they mined the coal and coke, and that's mentioned here. As a result of our coal history in Pennsylvania, either anywhere in Pennsylvania, a lot of places, your rights to the surface of the land are severed from the rights to the minerals under the ground. So you can buy land, but it doesn't necessarily mean you own the minerals underneath. And to even make it more complicated, if somebody owns the minerals under your land, their right to make money from those minerals has dominance over your right to farm the surface. So if they own the coal rights under your land and they want to come in and mine it, you have to reach an agreement with them. You can't say no. It's called a split estate, and that's a situation that this woman was in. They didn't want fracking on their farm, but they had to agree to it. Um, oh, and there's one other thing in here. She refers to the Hallowich kids. So the Hallowich family is a family in Washington County, south of Pittsburgh, who had 10 acres, they built a home, and they had this split, this split estate situation. And the gas company came in, they fracked, they also had a lot of processing stuff on their land. Children got sick. The parents, who were like high school teachers, um, became activists and they sued the gas company and eventually um, they reached a settlement. And usually what happens in these cases, the company buys them out and then there's a confidentiality agreement which means the people may never speak again of what happened. And in the case of this family, the two children aged seven and 10 were also affected by this silencing. So they, they were given a list of words they could never say again. And we only know this because some lawyers managed to intervene and get that agreement released. And in the book, there is a, a poem that's made of that agreement. But when she mentions the Hallowich kids, it was pretty famous in at least Western Pennsylvania that people saw photographs of these children. They were in National Geographic and stuff. So that's who she's talking about. And this is their farm. They didn't want to be photographed. A mother near the West Virginia line considers the public health. The industry thinks I'm too dumb to back down. They don't know I do this for my mom and dad. They were 69 and 71. He had pulmonary fibrosis, worked with asbestos all his life, she grew up near the coke ovens, back when kids were sent into the mines to pick coal. So they both had lung problems, but their home, the next holla over, sits 350 feet from a compressor station. We sealed the house, set up an air scrubber, but four of their neighbors passed last year, too. We bought the coal rights to our 115 acres because we know the company will come up to your front door. But we left the gas rights go. Just didn't see this coming. A gentleman from New Jersey leased our land. 
One day we come home to find pink ribbons tied in the field, then bulldozers. They put in four shallow wells and a Marcellus well on a five-acre pad 700 feet from our porch. The workers come in by the busload. All those strangers on our land 24-7 could have been rapists or pedophiles. For about a year, they didn't have a portage on. I looked out my window one morning to a guy peeing in the driveway. The dog brought in used toilet paper. The workers have to be young, strong, kids in trucks 12 to 16 hours a day that should be placarded hazardous waste. They live on junk food. I know because we picked up the wrappers. Then our dog disappeared. We saw Sarah's tracks in the snow go right up to the well pad. When crayfish died in our spring, we knew the methane had migrated. Now you can light it on fire. Our neighbor put in a water line. We guessed their well had gone bad and they'd settled, but they paid for it themselves. We had water buffaloes two years before we paid to run a line in from the road. When they laid the gas pipeline, those big trucks drove over our water line and busted it up. When I hollered at the drivers, I got dragged into court. Me and our son, four years old then, both got an injunction. They tried to say I'm an unfit mother too, but the judge wouldn't hear it. I look at pictures of my little one from that time, and he has the same dark circles under his eyes as the Hallowich kids. He'd get terrible stomach cramps, nothing we could do but hold him. My older boy had the nosebleeds and rashes. I couldn't keep him inside all the time. I'll show you pictures. If you speak up, you get more security. We had guards here 24-7, armed and unlicensed in Pennsylvania. They got real interested in my walks down by the crypt. One asked me, what do you do down there in the evening? I said, I walk and I have pawpaw trees. Want to come along? He could have used the exercise. So he walked with us and I got to know the night guard. His mom was sick the same time mine was. We're still in touch on Facebook. They drilled the gas pipeline on a weekend, didn't go where the DEP said, so it blew out in our creek. Bentonite and residual waste clouding clean water stocked with trout. That's when I cried. That creek flows into the Mon, and people get their drinking water out of that river. Another side effect of the drilling no one thinks about is all the swearing. And it's not just the men. (laughs) Alternate waste disposal on site means they can bury radioactive drill cuttings in your land. When they drained the frack pits, they shook the tarp and bulldozed the sludge into the ground, too. There's places we mow now, but we don't feed that hay to our horses. I can't dig or plant a post there. Why don't they tell us not to grow food or let beef graze back there? The stock sale registers animals now, so if I sell hay to a neighbor, He sells his steer and someone's sick from the meat. That comes back on me. People collect royalties on this well a mile away. We just care for the place and pay taxes. The well tenders come about once a week to the shallow wells and every day to the Marcellus. Two or three times a week, water trucks come in here and draw brine, and every two weeks they blow it down, so whatever's on the line goes into the air. Once, the brine tank vented for 45 minutes. My horse's eyes swelled shut. One eye went blind. They've had the nosebleeds. There's a big gum tree near the well that loses its leaves in the middle of summer. 
We saw clouds of silica sand blow off train cars over the Little League field, and someone was holding a newborn there with us in the stands. When I complained about them parking silica trains by the elementary school, the gentleman said, it's just sand. Your kids play in it. We didn't have internet before this, but you have to follow the permits because the industry tells you nothing. You have to go to the courthouse and pull your file. And when you find out what they did to your land, you're just sick. Let them think I'm too dumb to back down. My son won't play on any t-ball team with industry logos on their shirts. So one of the introducers, and I can't remember which one of you it was, um, read from the poem Gathering Lines. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read that poem now. This poem is is um, something like a collage. It uh, it has memories like my own memories of growing up driving around. I mean pe that's what people do in the country for fun. Like you just drive around. You know, it sounds crazy. And um, signs and memories of what you see along the road. And then it also has some excerpts from New York Times articles that are reporting mine explosions. So when they say fire damp, that's a 19th century word for methane. So when, when coal miners died in the mines from mine collapses, it was often because their lanterns caught the methane, because methane and coal kind of go together, natural gas, methane, and there was an explosion in the mine, and that's what caused the mine to collapse. So I'll just go like this when I get to those old New York Times things. So I guess what I'm trying to show you is the landscape, but also that um, traveling through the landscape, the history, like when you walk down, when you walk in your neighborhood where you grew up and you see things, those things have stories attached to them, right? They have memories from your childhood or even stories you might have heard. This poem is, is kind of doing that. And the poem ends up at, um, it ends up in Uniontown at a zoning hearing meeting where people are testifying and there's also gas company people there. Gathering lines. I'm 22, old road name for William Penn. Drive west past streakers, cheaters, live dancers, the beehive. Past paper signs staked in the ditch. Stop the war on coal. Fire Obama. And cash for your used guns. On one billboard, a blonde aims a pistol. Yes, you can learn to shoot. On another, Washington spies on your phone calls and emails. Call your congressman. Dismantled rigs on flatbeds creep toward the Alleghenies. At Delmont, one of the largest Natural gas storage sites in the nation, brags Westmoreland's website, turn south on the tollway. On 119, past new Baker Hughes offices behind mirrored windows across from the old VW plant where our dairy princess's dad got his first factory job, then quit. Farmers would rather milk cows and drive bus broke then punch a clock, stand inside on a line all day and answer to a boss. When the factory closed in 88, one laid off man shot himself in a car outside the plant on the straightaway kids used to drag race. At a dozen, the union rep from Mount Pleasant 
quit counting unemployed suicides. No one loved the rabbit anyway. The auto plant now houses Westmoreland County Community College's shell net, courses for credit or 17-day trainings for entry-level oil and gas jobs, first aid, rough terrain forklift, aerial work platform, defensive driving. Local radio still plays anthems from driving around in the old days. Dirty deeds, dumb dirt cheap, flirting with disaster, highway to hell. Sweet grass and Timothy hay blast through the window. At 981, more wood, beehive coke ovens, and the coal patch raised to make a highway and strip mines Nine strikers shot in April 1891, then buried with the remains of 109 hunkies blasted from Mammoth Number no. 1 that January when a miner's oil lamp ignited the cruel gas, the afterdamp that followed the fire damp explosion suffocated nearly every workman. The mine is now on fire. It is feared the bodies will be cremated, wives and families left wholly dependent on the charity of the world. Work has been exceedingly scarce since the dullness in the demand for coke. Soft coal baked to its silver bones, so close to pure carbon its uncrystallized diamond. At the Coal and Coke Heritage Center, the archivist says, the most common request is record of a relative's death in a mine. Across Route 119, pneumatic bulk tankers for silica sand shine in the sun, such stainless steel. When Walmart's glass doors parted, the tax collector from Dunbar stepped into an odor so foul, people ran to their cars. Coat over her head, throat and chest burning, she called national response. Deep breaths still hurt. Five died lately from brain cancer in Dunbar, but when she brings that up, people say, what the hell, Mary Grace? We all die sometime. What the hell? You might get hit by a truck tonight. They joke the gas companies don't hire locals because no one around here can pass the drug test. Cowboy Boots says, this place is crazy. Y'all have deep mines that catch fire, and does anyone know where they are? After the public hearing in Uniontown, men paid to sit in back claim the noxious smells that gag our home place come from meth labs in the hollow. DEP, <clears throat> don't expect protection. Hit a deer, bring your car here. OK, I think what I'd like to do, that's, those are the coke ovens. Um, what I'd like to do is just pause now and see if there are questions. And then maybe I'll finish with one more poem. Is anybody here from an area where there is either in southwestern Pennsylvania or north central Pennsylvania where you know there's fracking somewhere nearby? One, one. Yes. A question. Yes, please. Um, so thank you, first of all. This is really extraordinary work. Um, I was interested uh, by what you said about how you know you began as a poet writing. I don't think you used these terms, but tell me if it seems fair, a, a more sort of conventional kind of poetry or less mm -hmm. not in this documentary mode. Mm -hmm. um, and and so you know, I guess my question for you is like, it seems obvious what the um, documentary method is like adding to your poetry, like 
the material that it's giving you and the kind of depth and richness of the work and the reach and the relevance of the work and all of that. I guess I wonder what, how, how you think about what's happening like in the other direction. Like what is it that poetry or that your you know, skill as a poet, your career as a poet is giving to the documentary material that say, um, you know, like a, a nonfiction prose version of the treatment of this material wouldn't be able to, um, I'm trying not to use mining metaphors, but like wouldn't be able to extract, you know. To or, like drill know. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there is, interestingly, this, the around the same time my book came out, a nonfiction book about fracking in southwestern Pennsylvania it came out by Eliza Griswold that just won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and it's called Amity and Prosperity. It's an amazing, amazing book. And I think, um, and I bow down to that book. I think that what this does is it's short, it's concise. It, it's what poetry does. It, it gives you some brief, intense, experience. That's what I hope anyway. That it gives you some intense experience of someone else's experience with the hope that people will first of all see and understand a little bit of what's happening because a lot of these stories just people don't know about. And the people who are living them, whose lives have just been wrecked, um, feel very alone. So I, I think it's the brevity. It's yeah, that's poetry's magic. Great. Thank you. Yeah. What I'd like to do maybe, unless is there another question? Maybe what I'll do is end with by reading um, one of the, my old short um, lyric poems from my last book. And this poem is in some ways related to these. My father worked for Westinghouse, which was one of the great industri you know, industrial giants of Pittsburgh. Um, he worked in re scientific research. And that company collapsed in the late 90s. And this poem is, is essentially a letter I wrote to him at the time when everybody was getting laid off. And it, I see it as, but my father grew up on an Amish farm as an Amish child plowing with horses. And this poem is attempting to remind him of the earth. And um, I see this as something that I always return to. And it's in many ways why I'm so concerned about this, the fracking issue. And uh, you know, really, more broadly climate, because fracking is just one symptom of the way people are thinking about energy. Letter to Dad from New Danville, Pennsylvania. When I can no longer stand to read or write in any chair or couch in the house, I bank the fire and head out into the night slither between electric fence lines and climb a ridge where you can see lights from Lancaster City all the way to the black Susquehanna. I lie down there under Orion's belt until snow melts through my hair to the back of my head. This is the best thing you ever taught me, to stop and stretch out under tree limbs or clouds. I almost forgot how good a pasture feels beneath a sore back. And these evil days when you can't say who will sign your check or for how long, as friends of 30 years get canned or quit or just turn silent, you must walk out onto that smooth swath of Westinghouse lawn and lie down. Think how the sky will open above you. Think how the ground will hold you, as it always has. 
as it certainly will until it takes you once and for all. Thank you for listening.